Gee, honey, what's for dinner? Oh, I don't know, dear. How about a nice big bowl of fascism? Piping hot fascism. Oh, yes, I love fascism. Fascism for lunch, fascism for dinner, and fascism in the middle of the night when I need that little fascism snack. That's right. Wake up and smell the frickin' fascism. Fascism is here, and it's wrapped in an American flag made by Chinese slaves in labor camps. How's that for frickin' irony? No, actually, this is Daniel Estulin discussing his new book, The Bilderberg Group. It's a very unusual event for me in the sense that uh, um, we've sold almost two million books worldwide, almost two million books. My book has been published in 51 countries and uh, translated <coughs> into 31 languages. Could I have some water? Is it possible? Thanks. Uh, we've been doing interviews for the entire week, I think. I'm, I need some water. My book has been published in uh, 51 countries and translated into 31 languages worldwide. We've sold almost two million copies. Yet amazingly enough, in the United States, the man who asked to publish my book is this, you know, hippie-looking character. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I say with the greatest love and admiration because I've got to know this man in October when I came to the United States for the first time in, in, in over a decade. And um, I have to tell you, that it, again, it's an amazing experience for me because, in, you know, in Europe, I can sell out a 4,000-seat stadium in about half an hour at about $80 a pop. And the fact is, is that uh, having done all these interviews over the past few days, and instead of having, I don't know, 10,000, 20,000 Oregonians coming here to see this, because I think it's important, not because I'm here speaking, but because we're here looking at, at another perspective of reality, a reality which unfortunately most in the mainstream press are not prepared to cover. So I don't know how many people you can draw to a basketball game, mm -hmm. but I have a feeling a lot more than than the people are here. Now let me ask you a question. How many are familiar with this group called the Bilderberg Group? How many of you are familiar with the Bilderbergers before <coughs> I've written this book? Well, it's, that's fantastic. So actually quite a, quite a few of them. What can you tell me about these people? Evil. <laughs> Rich and powerful. They're mostly a bunch of landowners and bankers, the majority of them. Anything else? Well, you know, uh, what we, one of the things we're going to be doing is destroying a lot of cliches. And one of the things we're going to be looking at is uh, looking at ways we can fight there. Again, it's a very highly principled opponent we're dealing with. You may think that they're evil. You may not agree with them. But again, these are brilliant people. And you have to respect them for what they are. You may not like it, but you have to respect them. And one of the things we're going to be looking at is how to fight their principles without principles. And forgetting about fighting principles with technique. What we're going to do is I'm going to talk to you about the Bilderbergers, explain how the, stru what the structure of their organization, how they work, what they do in their annual meetings. Um, I have lots of photographs and documents to show you from the annual meetings. I always attend these things annually. We're also going to talk about the past because, again, what today is called the Bilderberg Group or the Bilderberg Club. 600 years ago, it was called something else because, again, Bilderberg is only 53 years young, no group, no matter how powerful it is. Being 50 years young in human terms could be as powerful as the Bilderbergers are. You have to understand the past in order to understand the present and come out better people with more knowledge and more empowerment. We're also going to go into the future. We're going to talk about the near future because I don't think there is uh, more beyond the, uh, the near future. So before we actually get into the thing on the Bilderberg group, let me just show you the photographs of uh, some of their meetings. Um, Etienne d'Avignon, David Rockefeller. Can you guys see well the uh, the photographs? It's a little. Can we dim the lights? A little? Can we dim the lights a little bit? Yeah. Just for a little while, just while we get this. How's that? Is that better? That's better. Okay. Now, uh, how many of you can actually tell who is in the photograph? Richard Pearl. Richard Pearl. That's Richard Pearl. Who else? Henry Kravitz. Where? Herman Jordan. The bald guy. Yeah. Okay, what else? Herman Jordan. Front left. Okay, the black guy. Paul Burke. Where? With his head turned in the blue shirt. Okay, what else? Who's this? <laughs> Who's that? Mephistopheles. Uh, Kravitz's wife, isn't it? Yeah, what's her name? Uh, <laughs> her name is Marie Jose Kravitz, exactly. She works for the Hudson Institute. If you guys want to win this war, this is actually a good example. If you want to win this war, you have to understand. You have to know who these people are, what they do. You have to learn 
their occupations, memorize their faces, so you can actually fight, as someone said, this evil. Because again, you're fighting a very principled opponent. It's not enough to stand with a sign saying, you know, down with the Bilderbergers. That doesn't do shit. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to the next photograph. That's uh, Donald Graham in the back seat with a seat belt on. He is the CEO of the Washington Post. That's uh, Mr. Wolf. He is the uh, Pulitzer Prize winning reporter for the uh, Financial Times. That's Vernon Jordan. That's Jessica Matthews of Carnegie Endowment for Peace mm -hmm. in 2004 in stress in Italy. That's uh, Mr. Hubbard. Until recently, he was one of the key uh, financial advisors for Mr. Bush. This is actually quite an interesting photograph. Uh, who is this guy? Oz. That's Richard Haas. What does he do? He is uh, he's the president of the Bilderberg. Well, no, he's not the president of the Bilderbergers. No, no, that's Etienne de Vignon. That's the bald guy in the first photograph. He is the, uh, exactly, of the Council of Foreign Relations. That's Kravis. Who is this guy? Kravis. Who is Bernabe? Uh, Rothschild. He's the Rothschild representative in Europe. And that guy in the back, you know, the alcoholic with the glass? <laughs> That's Holbrook, exactly. Again, learn who these people are, memorize their faces. All of these individuals, this is from Stressa in Italy, 2004. It's amazing. Get any one of these individuals anywhere in the world traveling around. You can have about as many people asking them questions as you have in this room. Yet again, you meet, get all of them together in one room. You throw in a few presidents of European nations, a few bankers, a few others, and there's nobody, absolutely no one, talking about these individuals. <laughs> Let's go to the next photograph. I'm going to take questions later on, okay? If you don't mind. Again, this guy here, that's Douglas Fyth. All right, yeah. that's Douglas Fyth right over there. This is an interesting photograph. You're talking about the mass media. This guy over there with glasses, his name is? No, Martin Wolf, no. This is Martin Wolf. Who's that? That's Woolridge. He is for The Economist. That's Haas. That's? That's Kagan. You're looking at the leading representatives of the mass media, okay? the Pulitzer Prize winning reporters, and again, you might want to ask yourselves why none of this information ever gets out of the mainstream press. <laughs> <clears throat> Next, well, again, this is in stress in 2004. This is Henri de Castre. This is the president of AXA, one of the most important insurance companies in the world. This is quite a photograph. Again, this is in 2004 in stress in Italy. You're looking at the CEO of uh, the Washington Post, uh, the senior vice president, who is now the president of Pepsi Cola, Indra Nui, who is this week on the cover of uh, Fortune magazine. And uh, that's Marie Jose Kravis. She is Henry Kravis's wife, and she is the fellow at the Hudson Institute. Next photograph, the same, the same individuals. The ball gun behind them is, is Henry Kravis, obviously, of KKR. That's uh, uh, Dermot Gleeson. He is the president of uh, Irish Bank, uh, former uh, minister of uh, finance in, in Ireland. That's the president of the Bilderbergers, Monsieur Etienne de Vignon from Belgium. Uh, this is a, quite a photograph. This guy right there, that's Holbrook. Who's that? Is that Blair? No, that's John Edwards. You've heard of him, right? No. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's go to the next photograph. Amazingly enough, he's not talking about his participation at the Bilderberg conference. This is the kind of stuff I have to deal with every time I go to these conferences. I'll tell you about it in a minute, my experiences. The Italian police in 2004, the Carabinieri. This is a hotel. You have to give it to them. They have an amazing taste. You know, the eat the dress well. God damn, that's quite a hotel. Uh, again, this is the Italian paratroopers protecting Bilderbergers from me. This is quite a photograph, too. I can get damn nasty, just ask Chris. Is that right? Right, right. Especially when I wake up in the morning for a 7.30 interview, right? Uh, you're looking at here, this is uh, Martin Taylor. He's a secretary, important man uh, in, uh, in Goldman Sachs. This is Craig Mundy uh, of uh, Microsoft. Again, you're looking at the key representatives. This is from 2004 meeting in, uh, in, in Italian resort and stress on the, on the uh, Lake Maggiore. Uh, that right there is Richard Pearl, <coughs> protected by the Italian Secret Service. Uh, quite a photograph, right in front of the hotel. Coincidence, you know, the Stressa 33, that's the, the, the highway itself. This guy telling me to get off the road. Italian police, paratroopers, 